the path that led me to create CBA with colleagues was I was a, what's called a junior fellow at Harvard. I was visiting MIT through Marvin because I was interested in the physics of musical instruments. Mm -hmm. I oh, this will be another slight digression. I uh, and Cornell, I would study physics, and and then I would cross the street and go to the music department where mm -hmm. I played the bassoon, and I would trim reeds and play the reeds, right. and they'd be beautiful, but then they'd get soggy. And then I discovered in the basement of the music department at Cornell was David Borden. Uh, who you might not have heard of, but is legendary in electronic music because he was really the first electronic musician. So Bob Moog, who invented um, Moog synthesizers, was a physics student at Cornell, like me, crossing the street. And eventually he was kicked out and invented electronic music. David Borden was the first musician who created electronic music. So he's legendary for people like Phil Glass and Steve Reich. And so that got me thinking about I would behave as a scientist in the music department, but not in in the physics department, but not in the music department. Got me thinking about what's the computational capacity of a musical instrument. And through Marvin, he introduced me to Todd Backover at the Media Lab, who was just about to start a project with Yo-Yo Ma to, um, that led to a collaboration uh, to instrument a cello, to, to extract Yo-Yo's data and uh, bring it out into computational environments. What is the computational capacity of a musical instrument? Uh, as we continue on this tangent, and we shall return to CBA. Yeah. So one part of that is to understand the computing. And if you look at like the finest time scale and length scale, you need to model the physics. It, it's not heroic. You know, a, a good GPU can do teraflops today. That, that used to be a national class supercomputer. Now it's just a GPU. And that's about, if you take the time scales and length scales relevant for the physics, that's about the scale of the physics computing. For Yo-Yo, what was really driving it was he's completely unsentimental about the Strad. It's not that it makes some magical wiggles in the sound wave. It's, it's performance as a controller, how he can manipulate it as an interface device. Mm -hmm. Interface between what and what exactly? Him and sound. Okay. And so, and so what it led to was, I had started by thinking about ops per second, but Yo-Yo's question was really um, resolution and bandwidth. It's um, how fast can you measure what he does, and um, uh, the 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 bandwidth and the resolution of detecting his controls and then mapping them into sounds. Mm -hmm. And what what we found, what he found was if you instrument everything he does and connect it to almost anything, it sounds like yo-yo. That 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 the magic is in the control, not in ineffable details in how the wood wiggles. And so with, with Yo-Yo and Todd, that led to a piece. And uh, towards the end, I asked Yo-Yo what what it would take for him to get rid of his strat and use our stuff. And his answer was just logistics. It was at that time, our stuff was like a rack of electronics and lots of cables and some grad students to, to make it work. Once the technology becomes as invisible as the strad, that, then sure, absolutely, he, he would take it. And by the way, as a footnote on the footnote, an accident in the sensing of Yo-Yo's cello led to a $100 million a year auto safety business to control airbags in cars. How did that work? I had to instrument the bow without interfering with it. So I um, set up um, local electromagnetic fields mm -hmm. where I would um, detect um, how those fields interact with the bow he's playing. But we had a problem that his hand, when, whenever his hand got near these sensing fields, I would start sensing his hand rather than the materials on the bow. Yes. And I didn't quite understand what was going on with those that that interference. So my very first grad student ever, uh, Josh Smith, uh, did a thesis on tomography with electric fields, how to see in 3D with electric fields. Then through Todd and at that point, research scientist in my lab, Joe Paradiso, it led to a collaboration with uh, Penn and Teller who, um, where we did a magic trick in Las Vegas to contact Houdini. And sort of these fields are sort of like, you know, contacting spirits. Mm -hmm. So we did a magic trick in Las Vegas. And then the, the crazy thing that happened after that was uh, Phil Rittmuller um, came running into my lab. He worked with, um, this became with Honda and NEC, airbags were killing infants in rear-facing child seats. Um, cars need to distinguish uh, a front-facing adult where you'd save the life 
versus a bag of groceries where you don't need to fire the airbag versus a rear-facing infant where you would kill it. And so the, the, the seat need to, in effect, see in 3D to understand the occupants. And so we took the Penn and Teller magic trick derived from Josh's thesis from Yo-Yo's Cello to an auto show. And all the car companies said, great, where, when can we buy it? And so that became Elisys, uh, and uh, it was a $100 million a year business making sensors. There wasn't a lot of publicity because it was in the car, so the car didn't kill you. So they didn't sort of advertise, we have nice sensors so the car doesn't kill you, yeah. but it became a leading auto safety sensor. And that started from the cello and the question of the computational capacity right. of a musical instrument. Right. 